So for a traditional partnership, that's not an LLP, a separate, not a separate legal entity, just a collection of, of individuals. The position is that you cannot be uh, both a partner and an employee of that same partnership. And in the context of traditional partnership, that makes a very good sense because um, given that a traditional partnership is just a collection of individuals, if that traditional partnership is uh, say A, B and C trading together as a partnership, uh, then if uh, that partnership was to employ A, effectively it would be A employing him or herself. That would be a very odd concept. Um, and also the concept of partnership and employment is said to be very different in nature. So one can see that that would mean uh, that for a traditional partnership, one ought not to be able to be both a partner and an employee in the same traditional partnership. It's fair to note that in Clyde & Co, uh, in the Supreme Court, there was some discussion amongst the uh, Supreme Court justices as to whether the law in that area ought to be reviewed, but they did not do so. Um, and maybe that in, in another, uh, another occasion, um, a court does have a look at that basic principle. But the, the law remains quite clear in the traditional partnership arena. The complication therefore comes if we go back to the uh, section 4.4 of the LLP Act, that that section says that a member of an LLP shall not be regarded for any purposes employed by the LLP unless if he and the other members were partners in a partnership, he would be regarded for that purpose as employed by the partnership. So if one looks at the words in bold, the difficulty there is that given that uh, you would never be regarded as employed by a partnership if you're also a partner, uh, that would seem to suggest that you can never be both an employee and a member of the same NLP. That brings us to the Scottish case of Rennie and Rennie, which was a 2020 decision. Um, now, in that case, the expulsion clause provided that if any partner shall, in any of various listed ways, breach their duties, the other part partners may expel that partner. Now, a further clause of the partnership agreement provided for any dispute as to a partner's expulsion to be referred to arbitration. So facially, there was some affinity with the Green case. A decision to expel a partner under this clause was held by the court to be quasi-judicial, with the consequence that natural justice was required in the exercise of that power. And there were two factors principally which the court found made the decision a quasi-judicial one. Firstly, the partners had to determine whether any of the listed breaches had taken place. They were therefore called upon to determine by consideration whether the grounds for the exercise of the power were met. But secondly, the power was specified to give the partners a right to expel, but not to oblige them to do so. In other words, it was couched in the terms that they may expel a partner having breached his obligation. And that entailed, the court said, that there was a discretion as to whether to exercise that power. And that discretionary element of the power entailed that the decision as to whether to exercise it was quasi-judicial. Rennie and Rennie itself recognised that the facts of Green and Howell were perhaps not distinguishable from the facts of Rennie, but the court concluded that the decision that that case had involved a mere assertion for these purposes was disputable. So to some extent, what Rennie did there was to uh, accept the finding of Green and Howell, but to question its application of its own legal doctrine to the facts of the very case in which it had been propounded. That is somewhat curious, but again, that is the nature of what's said.